Gig Gab, episode 348 for Monday, June 27th, 2022. Folks, and welcome to or welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. How goes it, Mr. Kent? Well, it goes well. <laughs> um, many things in life are in flow as they sometimes be. Uh, y- Nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. No, there's not. There's nothing wrong with that. You know what's interesting is music and the priorities of playing music are usually at the top of my list of, of many things in life. Balancing, of course, with you know home life, family life, and all those types of things. Sure. But music is important, and so you kind of look at those things. And every once in a while, you have a bunch of stuff in life happen, and all of a sudden, you're you know you're kind of looking at those music priorities and and and. You, you ask yourself, are they in the right place? Yeah. Right? Yep. Life happens. Life happens. And, uh, you know, getting that flyer done for that show is not worth the 30 minutes, you know, that it might have been at some other point in recent history. You know what I'm sure. saying? I, I totally. Yes. I, I, I have some things to say about that, but I'll, I'll but, but I'll simply acknowledge that. Yes, I totally understand. Yep. Yeah, you know, li- life life is what happens when you're busy making other plans, as John Len- John Lennon said. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, uh, you know, just came back from a really nice week of vacation uh, out in nature. It was great. Uh, did see a band, which I want to talk about. But you know, every once in a while, the the type A personality of trying to pull a band to greater heights all the time to be better, to be better prepared, to be, you know, you know, more prepared to be the band of choice for the next good gig that comes up. All those, all those things are an incredible amount of energy. And sometimes you, you know, you say, well, what would happen if I didn't put all that amount of energy? Would they really not happen or would they not happen to my expectation or would they happen anyway? Yep. And it's just kind of an interesting uh, thing. You know, I I think you and I are similar in that sometimes we we try to will things to success, right? Oh yeah, the willing to success. That's you know, I call it bullheaded persistence. But sure, yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, and you know, you have your you have your worldview which tells you what process to take to will those things to success. Yep. And sometimes it, persistence is is the best tool. But uh, yeah, I think I'm at a place now where a few life things are kind of floating around. And the amount of time that it takes to the amount of willful persistence that is naturally coming out of me at this moment in time, and I'm not saying it's not going to be different tomorrow, but all of a sudden, you know, a little perspective that there's a lot of things in life. Uh, my my friend Steve Strom used to say, "We're not splitting the atom here. We're it's not. We're not doing brain surgery. Yeah, we're not Don't saving do lives. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, but that's not my natural way of being. My natural way of being is to push." Sure. And, uh, and, uh, right now after a nice week with good friends and, you know, just kind of enjoying life, I'd like to just kind of show up at some gigs for a while and just, you know, play and just enjoy that exchange, not worry about the next gig, not, you know, really be present in the moment of the gigs that I am, Yep. which I can definitely say I'm often guilty of, like, I love playing, but my mind is always going to, you know, I got to get to the booking guy right afterwards and see if he wants to book the next one. And, and uh, you know, oh, and in fact, you know, the House Rockers are playing July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. I got the 5th and 6th off. We're playing the 7th. I have an acoustic gig the 8th, and we're playing the 10th. So the next 10 days uh, over the holiday weekend uh, are, are going to be quite busy for us. And, you know, again, maybe that'll snap me back into a focus of a different type, but I don't know what it's like to just show up and, and play without having some, you know, checklist of things I got to, I got to deal with. Yeah. And today I'm feeling like I just want to show up and play. You want to show know, up and play. Like, well, yeah. I can, I can tell you, I, and I don't know, I, I don't know that it's this, that the, there's a polar opposite scenario here because I, I mean, I, I have, I spent the last week showing up and playing for gigs that other people had arranged, uh, sort uh-huh. of. But, you know, you're like 
if it's always in my head, like, well, how are we going to make sure that this one comes across the right way so that, you know, we we get the next booking and or I get the next call? Even right, if you you know, if you, depending on how you're looking at it, it's. It, I think it's all kind of the same. <laughs> but but I get what you, I, I to a degree. I get what you're saying. Yeah, I um, I had so what what you're about to head into this weekend. I had my own version of that last week. Started on Tuesday with back to back rehearsals Tuesday and Wednesday for this um, for the speaking in tongues, the talking in heads record that I do with my friend Stu. And it continued through Saturday, and I have some things to share about all of it. But over those those whatever five days, I had four gigs, three rehearsals. I played with eighteen different musicians, not including me. Yep, and and it was it was magical. But heading into it, you know your your comment about priorities. It was interesting because. As I was heading into this, it was like, oh, man, like I've really done it to myself because starting Tuesday night, that was it. Like there was no there was no day where I, I was not like playing with other people, uh, either rehearsing or gigging or both. Uh, Saturday, we had a bitter pill rehearsal and then a bitter pill gig uh, that evening. And as I was heading into it, I'm like, oh, man, I, you know, this is too much. I don't want to do this. And then finally, I was like, no, wait, 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 like slow down, reframe, think about it. Just make music the priority for the next five days. And then everything sort of falls into place and it's all fine. <laughs> and it really did. It worked out nicely. There were those rehearsals that I did with Stu on Tuesday and Wednesday. They ended earlier than anticipated. So I was able to have a nice dinner with my wife on Wednesday night, which was sort of a bonus for us. We played that Talking Heads gig on Thursday. There were nine of us on stage uh, and it was – it really was a blast. I mean, you know – it was the first time we were sort of by definition under rehearsed doing this. And we were we were fine, but it, you know, you always want more. So after the show, it was like, well, there's there were some amazingly magical moments. And then there were some moments where I'd like to have another shot at it, you know. <laughs> and and I think we all sort of felt that way coming off. It was like, okay, well, that, that was a success. Now, uh, now I know what I want to do next time, you know. There you go. And it was packed. I mean, like, like I, like it's a good thing the fire marshal wasn't there packed. I, I, I'm not <laughs> exactly sure what the what the rationale was for allowing that many people in there. My guess it's just greenbacks, but um, it was it was tough getting to and from the stage. Let me put it that way. Um, but but you know that makes it fun when you're on stage. I thought the stage was going to be crowded with nine of us. It turns out that was the most spacious place in the uh, in, in the house. That's so funny. Yep. And then, and then Friday night, Friday night was, uh, well, I, Thursday night, a, a first happened. And with nine of us on stage, Mike Marchand uh, was doing sound at the press room as he often does. He's the house guy there. I've worked with him in many venues, including that one. And he's a fantastic engineer. I've got a great working relationship with him. He knows what he's doing. He's super chill. He just kind of, you know, but he keeps his eye on the prize. He knows how to get things done. And... I was playing percussion for this. Uh, there was a, a drummer and we had worked out. It was really great how he and I had like figured out how to work together. He was like, I think I'm going to play with no toms. I'm just going to use kick, snare and cymbals. And that, that, that really sort of gave us each room to do what we were going to do. And it, it worked out great. But, you know, there were a lot of us on stage and, and he was getting everybody set up as he, as he would. And I heard him say he had set up a monitor wedge for me, which is fine. You know, okay, no problem. And, uh, I heard him saying to one of our guitar players, he was like, oh, yeah, he's like, I guess I'm going to need you to share a mix here. He's like, I actually have an extra send, but I don't have another wedge. And as I heard him say it, I was like, hey, Mike, I, Mike, your choice. But if you just give me a send, I can feed my in-ears. That's fine. He's like, oh, my God, that would be amazing. And so I pointed out to him, I'm like, okay, let, let us both acknowledge that this is the first time that a musician showing up with in-ears actually helps the sound engineer. <laughs> like, we've never seen yeah. this before. He's like, yeah. And, uh, and it worked out fine. It worked out great, in fact. So that, that part of that was nice. Uh, the next night, I played at the Rochester Opera House with Fling and Bitter Pill. We did a double bill. Uh, obviously made it easy for me because it was, you know, one, <laughs> one drum set. <laughs> I didn't really yeah. get a break, but that was okay. Unfortunately, the engineer that they had, great guy, super well-intentioned, 
fairly knowledgeable, but it was his first time ever running front of house by himself. And mm-hmm. yeah, right. So it was a little bit of being thrown to the wolves for this poor kid. And, and he did fine, but thankfully, you know, Billy from bitter pill and Russ from fling and, and, and I were there and between the four of us, we got things set up and the guy was really nice. He's like, Oh yeah, if you want to use in-ears, no problem. I can, you know, you know, carve out these mixes and everything. And then it was, you know, about time to like sound check quick so that we could open the house. And he's like, yeah, so I'm not sure where to have you guys plug in your in-ears. And I'm like, well, yes, same. I mean, cause this is a, an old opera house. You know, the, the board is at, at, you know, one end of the, the room and the stage is at the other end and it's wired. Like, you know, they had a Mackie or a, yeah, sorry, a, a Behringer or Midas, one of those, you know, 32 series boards. And uh, I think it was the Midas version, but you know, basically the same. And you can route those things any way you like, but I don't know how they had that thing routed, you know? <laughs> And so yeah. I was like, well, what would you do if you were plugging in wedges? And he's like, oh, they're powered wedges. I would just, or they're, they're passive wedges. I would just plug them into the speak on cables. And it was like, okay, we have like 10 minutes left. So we're going with wedges. Forget about the in ears. Like we don't know where to plug these things in. And so that night we went, we went that direction, but it worked out fine. He, uh, you know, Billy helped him while Fling played their set. Russ helped him while Bitter Pill played our set. And, you know, it worked, it worked out okay. It was, it was, it was fine. We, we got there. Yeah, exactly. And we entertained and it sounded fine on stage and sounded fine in the room, but the poor, I I really felt bad for the poor kid because, you know, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, but we have an interesting gig coming up on, on uh, Saturday night. Yeah. It's a five band lineup, right? Okay. And uh, it's a ticketed thing that this guy does as a business. He, you know, hires five good local bands and, uh, and, uh, you know, sells tickets to it and, you know, hopes to get five, six, 700 tickets. Sure. And uh, he said, it's a 20 minute turnover. Yeah. And, and I was like, you sure you want to do that with a 10 piece band? He goes, trust me, I do these all the time. It works if everybody hustles. I was like, all right, backline it, drums are, are provided good, good drum set. And he offered other things, but you know, people want to kind of have their tone. So it's not really much time for me to, yeah, you know, I, I'm good in 20 minutes to get my stuff on. Sure. Of course the whole thing is about ears, right? And, um, uh, you know, I think we can get on stage and be ready to play, but I think, uh, you know, it's getting everybody comfortable. It's a one hour set and it, you know, gets to be like the amount of, uh, pain and suffering to get going. And the, the sound guy, we can't tell if he's hostile to us bringing a splitter and, you know, running our, our in-ears or, you know, what's going on. Bill's working on getting it done, but, you know, it's like everything. You, you just want to be comfortable and you just want to get up there and do your thing. Right. Yeah, but, uh, right. the you know, this would be this would be the other side of the just I just want to show up and play right now. Right. I worry that my guys will get you know frustrated because they want to put on a good performance and and uh, but you know just getting comfortable. It was, it's just it's going to be a weird one on on Saturday night. You know, yeah. twenty minutes. Is that's it. that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's about what we did with from fling to bitter pill the other night, but a, it was literally the same drum set and drummer. Right. So there was nothing that needed to be changed. No heights of stands. It was like, I just walked off stage. The guys are like, how much time do you need? I'm like, I'm going to change my shirt. Cause I wore a a bitter pill shirt when fling played. And I wore a fling shirt when bitter pill played. But you know, other than that, it was like, I just, I'll pee and I'm good to go. (laughs) You know, like like I'm ready to go play. It was one setup. I mean, it, Fling ran all direct. So amp modelers it, direct into the house. Um, Bitter Pill ran about half and half. Uh, yep. One side of the stage goes direct. The other side of the stage is using amps. And so, but we had set all that stuff up in advance. So it, it really was a quick changeover. But, um, but yeah, you know, that gig sort of got me thinking about the conversation we've been having on and off here about, you know, have being ready with split tails and and just split tails being that you bring your own mixer uh you use that to mix your ears and then you send you split the xlr cables in effect and send the rest out, you know send one half of them out to the uh to the front of house and let them mix the front of house however they want and uh actually started a on uh sunday morning i started a conversation on Facebook in our Facebook group. I'll put a link to it about the, some people have given some great uh, suggestions for different 
you know, split tail units and ways to do it and things like that. So it's a, but like that, especially with it being fling and bitter pill, that would have been perfect the other night because, you know, like one mixer would have done the whole thing because we use one mixer for each band. It's like, (laughs) it's the same mixer, you know, so would have been totally set up and ready to go. But, um, yeah, 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 yeah. I know it's, but it's, you know, that's a big investment. It's a big it's a big headache to set it up and get to the point where it's automatic. Right. I mean, it's, there's a, there's a process to getting there. And like you said, you know, you show up with that. I mean, hopefully the stage plot and the advanced work that you, that you, you know, you or your band does communicates enough to the front of house engineer so that they're expecting it when they get there. But you know, some people, get weird about, Oh, I have to plug into your stuff. Like, I don't, you know, I do things my way. This isn't my way, you know, and, and that in and of itself can be a little bit of a derail for the evening. So I don't know, it's hard and it's not, it's not inexpensive to get that, right. you know, to, to do all of that. And for how, you know, how often is that going to actually come up? Would have been great on Friday night, but I didn't need it Thursday night or Saturday night, you know? <laughs> so, um, I don't know. Saturday, Saturday. Yeah, talk to you about, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I want to talk to you about uh, a group that I saw on, on yeah, go ahead. Uh, in Las Vegas. Yeah. All right. So we, uh, my little vacation last week, we went hiking in Utah with our friends. And uh, to do that, we flew into and out of Las Vegas. And so we had a night in Las Vegas. Music. And there was, uh, Uh-oh. there was a. What, what just happened to your microphone there, Paul? I don't know, man. Oh, you're fine now. Okay. Suddenly it sounded like you were on the other side of the room, but now you're right back. Uh, we're back in the same chairs. It's, it's perfect. Welcome back. All right. Anyway, there was a band playing that I had heard of before. And I actually knew a little bit about, about the backstory of the band. And the story of the band is very interesting for you and me and for our listeners. So the band was called the Spasmatics. Have you heard of them? Uh, I have. Yeah. All right. So here's the backstory. As far as I can tell, a booking company created this concept of the spasmatics. They are, you know, they, it's a four piece band, guitar, drums, a lead singer and a bass player. Yep. They dress like nerds, you know, pocket protectors, you know, shorts and dark socks and, you know, glasses that are taped together. They dress like nerds, hence the name. Yep. And this production company or this booking company created them and uh, as far as I can tell, they there are seven to ten spasmatics groups around the country. They cast these people like you know, like a cruise ship would cast them. Um, I don't know that they interchange the parts. I don't know if the singer in LA ends up you know going to Texas or, or whatever. I don't think they do that. But I think the playlist is the same. So it's kind of a hmm. almost a, almost like a franchise, franchise. model. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and but here's the thing. And I and I I I use that analogy of like a like a cruise ship. They're great musicians, and and they run through their cover set like butter. I mean, just all of them sing. The sound is great. They do play to clicks, and I do hear some keyboard parts or some additional guitar parts when there's nobody on stage playing these things. So there's you know a few triggered things going on, but. They make it look so easy. And I was thinking about, like, even in my band, sometimes during a show, there's that part of the show where you're wondering if the guy will get it right, right? Or if they've ironed out the yep. part that we talked about ironing out, right? Yeah, oh, you know, for there's, sure. There's, there's yes. A, there's a certain, you know, there there are parts of many Weekend Warrior cover band shows where it's just, are we going to be able to, are we going to be able to pull this off? And I'm watching the spasmatics and they are just, they're all, you know, clearly pros. I don't know whether they're the musical theater guys or whatever, but they're clearly pro musicians and it is just butter in their hands. They just run straight through their shows and there's, there is no looking around on stage. Like, you know, is he going to get it? You know, those moments of pause, it's almost like a a wedding, obviously a a very rehearsed show. Yeah, It's a, it's a theatrical show, not a, not a a live, not a, not a loose band on stage. Yeah. Not well. Yeah. But no, none of us, none of us think about being a loose band on stage, but it, it, you know, we, this ties to me to that conversation about what's a pro. Right. And I think, you know, I don't think 
I think you and I agree, pro is not necessarily about proficiency. A pro is in many ways about, you know, your preparation and, you know, your your professionalism and yeah. how you deal with the person handing you money and the people who come to see you. I mean, that's that's part of the definition. But this is, you know, clearly like these guys are working for somebody. And if they don't deliver the goods, they will be fired. They will right? be replaced. Yeah. yeah well, because I mean, it, yeah, guy, it's a it's a choreographed show. Right. Yeah. It's 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 the difference between a, you know, most touring bands out there put on a mostly choreographed show. Right. You know, they they have the same set list that they play every night, uh, yeah. you know, from city to city. And, and they are putting on a show and there's there's lights and, and video screens and, you know, all of the things in pyro, maybe whatever it is. You know, it's like we know exactly what's going to happen next. Everybody's rehearsed. And it sounds like the spasmatics do that at a, at a not arena level. Right. I, I don't want right. to say that they're not pro because it, they're literally doing the same thing. It's just smaller, smaller venues. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they are, they're put together for corporate and special events, Yep. but you know, like they said, this one, you know, pretty visible v Vegas venue you had them on a Sunday night and, um, and it was really enjoyable and That's awesome. you know, they just do their thing. The, the singer doesn't miss a note all night. There's no question. Everything from Take On Me, you know, yeah. all the way down to Jenny Jenny, um, mostly 80s stuff. And they just, it's just, I was just mostly reflecting on most bands I see, the rough spots stay rough spots. Mm. You know, like, like, like you talk about it and say, hey, you know, we should clean up that thing, right? And everybody looks at each other and nods and says, yeah, we should clean up that thing. But you kind of get this endemic, like, oh, well, you know, either I know he won't do it, so I'm not going to put that any time. You know, whatever it is. Yeah. This was no rough spots. Imagine a show with no rough spots, no question marks. Sure. It flows. Song, song flows. There's no, you know, awkward time between songs. It is exactly what we all should be doing. And there's no reason we can't be. And I know many of, many of our listeners will say, that's, a, that's my band. And, I, and I'm sure it is. But I also know that many bands that I go see, you know, they don't either don't have their between song rap yep. down or or there's a rough spot. And I've seen them twice or three times. The rough spot is in the same place every time. And you see the band members look around on stage and, and all those types of things. I, I guess I was just thinking, imagine a life where none of that happens, where everybody is completely rehearsed. Well, that right? what you're and, and this is why I keep coming back to the theater thing, because this is at least how it's supposed to go. And and in most cases, this is how theater works. You know, you have your, your talent. And I don't mean to say that not everybody in the room is talented, but you have the, the people who are performing on stage, right? Your, your actors, your singers, your dancers, and your musicians, right? And then you have a director who is in charge of making sure the whole thing comes together. And after every rehearsal, and sometimes even after performances, you sit down and the director hands notes out to everybody like, hey, you missed this one little tiny thing that if we yeah. polish that up and everybody else polishes up their stuff, it's going to take this thing to a whole other level. And they're rarely we've had this conversation, you know, on the on the show before about the concept of taking the note, because in those conversations, those post rehearsal conversations, when the director is giving notes the appropriate response when the director says you did this wrong, fix it is thank you. That's it. Right. You know, it's, that's how it goes. There's no argument. There's no discussion. Uh, generally sometimes the exceptions prove the rule, but otherwise it's like, that's the person who's in charge. They have the vision for this thing. They're telling you what needs to be done so that the, the greater good can be achieved. And what you're describing here with spasmatic sounds exactly like that. And it, that's, yep. you, you know, having, Having a director now, it it can it it doesn't need to, and it, some might argue it shouldn't, but it can have the effect of making it so vanilla and so safe that the element of that which is live performance starts to get lost. The, the you know the danger element of okay you know th because there's some entertainment value in, is that person going to hit the note? Is that person going to nail that solo? You know, are I they, gonna, so. I mean, but it, well, I mean, I, we've seen it right with bands that are so 
polished that they're not actually performing anymore, right? They're just going through the motions and playing everything perfectly, but it's boring, right? And so if, if you're, I might, let me just address that. So if your point is the entertainment value is, is, is the guy going to hit the note and take on me? Would you rather have that and, and therefore some safety net that if he doesn't, because you know, 60% or 40% of the time he doesn't hit the note and will make that awkward. No, 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 that's, that's not, you're you're misinterpreting. Maybe I said it the wrong way. The, if the person isn't making it look like what they're doing is both hard and fun and requires focus, like these guys, I'm sure they were on stage performing like they were putting everything into all of this, right? All of that stuff. But that, that is also part of the act, Right. Like if the guitar, if the singer is always going to hit that note, they don't need to look like they're working really hard to hit that note because they aren't. But they but they can act like they're working very hard to hit that note. And that's the part, the showmanship, if you will, that can get lost when a band, especially a band that doesn't have an uh, an objective presence right that director presence someone to say hey okay yeah now we're playing the songs perfectly but people are going to be bored because we're not actually performing them anymore we're just playing them we're not worried about it a lot of musicians if you're worried about it you will convey that you are worried about it and that adds that element of performance and danger you have to remember to add that back in even once you've got everything down and and i think there's a that's a big part of what makes somebody a pro is knowing I, I feel you. Yeah, knowing that you've got to put on the show. Even so I, even you though you're doing that, it every night, you've got to put on the show. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, we were with our wives and um I said, Oh, I know I know about the spasmatics because there is one in the San Francisco area that plays around. So I, I'd yeah. heard of them. And I said, you know, here's what I know. Anyway, the the people I were with, they kind of rolled their eyes like they dress like nerds, like, you know, this is gonna be all shtick, right? At the end of the day, they played a great set list of 80s rock effortlessly. The grooves were rock solid, and everybody was like, that was a really fun band because of the song list. Yeah. I think actually the shtick kind of faded into the background. You know, they, they and the shtick is actually, you know, they dress that way and they make a couple of silly. I don't actually think the shtick is actually carried out as far as they probably would do i mean the, the sure. banter is not that like they have a couple of like if he tells a stupid nerd joke you'll hear a, a laugh track or something come out of the speakers or something like that but um but at the end of the day it was just they played a great it, it's about the songs yeah. they played great songs they played play party songs for four yeah. hours well they probably put on a party is what it is like and that that's yeah. a big part of it don't don't forget that i i linked to the spasmatics in the show notes i also linked to if you dig in on their website there and it tells the whole story about, uh, you know, how the band was formed. I think, I think somebody, it was, it was LA where they started yeah. and somebody lost a bet or something, but um, they've got a, a, you can see their stage plot. I, I've, I've linked it as a sample stage plot, but it's a real stage plot for them, Yeah, you know, and, and this is a great, if you don't have one of these for your band, use this as your template because it, this really, tells you how to communicate with a, uh, you know, with a, uh, a sound team, if you will. Uh, so yeah, go check that out. It's, it's interesting. You, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, no, I was going to say you, you know, you mentioned that, uh, they clearly put the work in and, and some bands do and some bands don't. And I, I, I made a note, like I said, we had this rehearsal on Saturday with bitter pill. Uh, we've got our CD release, party coming up on Saturday on the second. And there's some songs that we have never played live before. At least as of Saturday, we had never played live before. And there's still some songs that we've never played live and we needed to get those down and, you know, rehearse them. You know, we, we wrote a lot of these tunes either here at my house as part of our retreat or in the studio or the parts for these tunes. I should say we wrote either here at my house or actually in the studio is where we created these parts. And there's some of these parts that are way beyond what, we would normally come up with if we were just, you know, throwing these things together quickly. Uh, and we needed to make sure we could not only play the parts again, but now we have to sing at the same time because it's not the studio and you can't time shift things. Uh-huh. And so, you know, these rehearsals have been great for, for all that. And it hit me. 
And I made a note about halfway through rehearsal that with Bitter Pill, we are we encourage one another to stretch and and improve, right? And and stretch our abilities and stretch what we do both individually and then you know collectively together as a band, we are we are pushing to be better players as a byproduct of these songs that we're doing and and the way that we're playing our gigs and all of that stuff. And it hit me that that's not the case in every band. A lot of bands, you know, you come in, you you know, you audition or whatever, you go through whatever the process is that that gets you into the band, and then the expectation is that you can continue to deliver at that level, you know, until the end of time, right? And and I mean, that's important, but it's at least for me interesting and 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 very uh, engaging. I love it to be in a band where it just as a, a, a fact, a, a, a sort of a foundational element of the band, everyone is encouraged to stretch. And sometimes it's, it's scary to stretch and, yeah. you know, try different things and even playing different instruments sometimes. And, you know, we're just playing different ways and all of that stuff. And I love it. But I, it, you know, I noticed that, I mean, here we are, you know, whatever, four years into this band and we're still doing this. It's not like day one and everybody, you know, at that rehearsal, we were like, no, no, let's try this. Let's, let's see if we can get this, you know, and, and really make this work and, and stretching, like I said, both as a band and in, as individuals. And I, I love let's it. Let's define that, man. Stretching, doing different things is different than stretching and throwing caution to the wind, what you put on stage. Oh, of course. This is in the rehearsal room for sure. Yeah. yeah. But it, but it's, you know, it's, well, and it's in the crafting of both the songs and the show itself, uh, you know, cause there's some songs that have evolved in ways, you know, pre existing songs that, that have evolved in ways that allow us each to stretch. And, and there are moments on stage where we will throw some level of caution to the wind, not all, but you know, some levels so that we can stretch and experiment and try things. And it's like, Oh, that worked. Wow. That was amazing. Or, well, that didn't work either. Let's go work on it. Or hmm, maybe it's not as great of an idea as we thought, you know, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but, but uh, it, it's, I love it. It's great. And I, honestly, I think that's part of what keeps people coming out to see us is part, not, not the, certainly, and probably not the biggest factor, but it is, you know, we are, we are, I am a better musician than I was when I started playing in this band. And I can attribute some level of that to the fact that I am playing in this band. And I, cool. I I like that. That that I think that that sort of crystallizes the, the thought that started percolating in my head on Saturday at rehearsal. It's like, yeah, so I, love I, this. I, I want to circle around one last time to yeah, this man. concept of the spasmatic s song list because it's relevant to what I'm doing. So, sure, they played stuff that I'm going to bet 95 percent of what they played is in almost everybody who listens to the show's set list somewhere, right? At least okay. one song, if not multiple songs. Sure. House Rockers right now are playing a lot of material because we've had some, we've had some turnover. Well, first we came out of COVID and we said we're going to just keep our A-list stuff from from years past. We don't have a lot of rehearsal time. Then we had some turnover and we have new guys and we don't have a lot of rehearsal time. And so we're playing pretty much stuff we've played for a pretty long time. And you know what? Nobody cares. I mean, no, I'm sorry. Nobody who comes to see us. They appreciate the show, even if they've been coming to see us for a long time. Sure. And I really, I, you know, I think about that noble pursuit that most cover bands go after to find that gem that nobody else is covering that you can bring to life in some way. And I know that that's a very rewarding thing. One song we did get pulled back, which we're having a lot of fun with, is uh, Bitches Back by Elton John. Yeah. Good song, right? And, and I, I, do you agree, like, every cover thing I've ever done the members collectively or individually are looking for that magic hidden gem that not everybody does. And, you know, the, at the one end of the scale is, is um, sweet home Alabama, right? Like, you know, wow, why, why do we want to do what everybody else does? But the question is every time we start sweet home Alabama, a shriek comes up from the crowd, yep. right? Dance floor every fills song the, right away. Every yep. song the spasmatics played is eighties cover band party music. I mean, so I, you know, sometimes I wonder like, in this thing about wanting to just show up and play and simplify my life is the, is the energy to find that hidden gem to differentiate yourself. Is that, is that really where the juice is or is it just play the, play the fake book stuff and be great and be charming on stage and you'll have a good career. 
I mean, I think if, if we're talking about cover bands, I, I think the the way the path I have found to success is twofold. Well, one is play some. You need to take a core of the fake book and have that in your set. If, if the idea is to be a party band, and, and there's all kinds of different cover bands, so let, let me let me really pigeonhole this, right? So you you want to be that band that people come out to it for the party, and if there's people in the room that haven't seen you before. You, you know, you want to be able to capture them as well. Right. So, you know, great for corporate things, great for weddings, works fine in a, in a you know, nightclub somewhere if, if you find that worth your while. But, you know, that that whole thing. So I think you need to find the core of what works for you, you know, of, of, of that fake book, the Sweet Home Alabama's, the Mustang Sally's, you know, you, you might be able to skip one of the, the, the core <laughs> songs. Right. But you basically, you, you know, that's what you're that that's the foundation. And then in terms of peppering it in. What you said as you started this this thread here with us is, hey, you know what song we're having fun with? And then you talked about the Elton John tune. I think the we're having fun with is the key there. And it relates directly back to our prior conversation. You need to be able to perform this and you need to be confident that you're performing it and having fun performing it. Now, if part of that fun for you is knowing that you're playing something that another band doesn't play fine, but don't let it come across as, you know, this holier than thou thing, let it come across as look how much fun we're having playing this. Mm. I, I really think, that, you know, so for this second half of this, you've got the core foundation. The second half of it is find songs that that particular lineup can play very well and, and just lean in on those. Now they, they, if again, if you want it to be for a party band, those songs are going to be a subset of the list of songs that are party songs, right? You know, you, you can't pull something out that n no one has ever heard, you know, not the, the, the not even a B side collection, right? Like those aren't going to work in that scenario, unless it just happens to be a song that that particular lineup of musicians can deliver so well and with so yeah. much enthusiasm that it's infectious anyway. And so you might find those like when when Fling was playing a lot of covers, we found a few of those and it was just like amazing. Look at this. We can go play it, it, for whatever reason. Our bass player brought in uh, Fish's sample in a jar. It was yeah. perfect for the Fling lineup. I, you know, I could dissect as to why. I don't know how he saw that that would work. I don't I don't know if he saw that would work, to be perfectly honest, but it just happened to be perfect. And we could play that song and we'd finish the set and people would be like. Man, what was that song? That was that a fish song you said? Like that's that was amazing. People would be so into it and have no idea they'd never heard the song before. We yeah. might as well do our originals though if we're going to do that. Like that, <laughs> and that was sort of the direction that that led Fling, you know, down to where we are now, but uh, or up to where we are now, perhaps I should say. But um, but yeah, find those songs that you have fun with, and that that lineup of musicians plays really well. And delivers and performs, and you're going to be in good shape. That, that all makes sense to me. I mean, it's that's a nice way to wrap it all together because there's so many bands who are like, well, we play what we want to play. Yes, and then they want to know why they're not getting booked, right? Right. <laughs> right. Well, you again, know, it needs but, to be but, a but, but, yeah, right. You know, but but you know, our chops are better than that band, or or you know, it, whatever whatever your self justifying reason is that you know you should be getting more gigs for these types of things. I don't like I said. If you're a cover band, it really is. You know, your job is to please the people who hire you. If it's a bar gig, your job is to, your job is to, you know, however it's defined, either bring your crowd in and, and have them drink beer, or you know, get the people who are the built-in crowd of the venue and have them drink beer and and yeah, you know, keep keep them in their seats or or out of their seats drinking beer, whatever that you know, whatever. Yep. Keep them in the room. That's it. Yep. 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 Anyway, so. Just just seeing some people who are just so effortless, flawless, it was kind of cool, you know? Yeah. In the cover band realm. I mean, I've seen good cover bands before, but, you know, many of them have that one thing where you're like, hmm, strange choice, you know, or, or you know, ooh, you know, <laughs> why, you know, a largely great show. Why was there that rough spot? Well, I, you know, I, um, I had the opportunity to see a cover band, certainly a cover show. Uh, there's this 
touring production. They play sort of, you know, smaller theaters that it's called. It was 50 years ago today. And they just finished their second tour. Their first tour was pre COVID. Uh, and the idea behind this is that it's a bunch of musicians, songwriters uh, who, you know, playing a Beatles record. Uh, so it started with, I think in 2018, maybe 2019, they did the white album and interspersed with the white album were two songs each from one of the artists on stage this year around, they did uh, rubber, rubber soul and revolver and the, the musicians on stage this time around. And it's mostly the same. I think there's, there was one swap out was uh, Todd Rundgren, uh, Christopher Cross, Denny Lane from Wings and uh, and Moody Blues, Joey Mullen from Badfinger, and Jason Sheff, who was the lead singer in Chicago uh, for quite some time. And then the backing band, and I don't know everyone's name in the backing band, but they were, I mean, they held it together. The drummer was Steve Ferroni. And I'm like, wait a minute, like this is a club, not much bigger than a club I've played. Like, is that Ferroni on stage with them? You know, and halfway through the show, they, they acknowledged that, yes, it was. Um, it, but they, you know, there were, there were, there was a guitar player and two, I'll say keyboard players plus the drummer, but the keyboard players, one of the keyboard players played everything and sang most of the key harmonies and all this stuff. But it was, it was weird. The show started. And everybody but Todd came on stage and they played Drive My Car. Uh, and then they played something else. And then Christopher Cross, who is the most bizarre thing, Paul. He, um, it, it, like, if you saw him on the street, you'd never know that this was Christopher Cross. It, he was in, like, black jeans, a, a black Steely Dan Asia shirt, and a black baseball hat with the Ukraine flag on it. And he just looked like some, you know pudgy dude playing guitar like it was fine you know he's he, and he he sounded great and when he played when they played sailing when that first line of the first verse came out of his mouth it was like wait what just happened guy, yeah. how, how did christopher cross's voice come out of that dude you know and we'd heard him yeah. sing all night he had sung eleanor rigby and other things but they played the first two tunes and then christopher cross came up to the mic and he's like hey you probably noticed that todd uh, todd's not here yet uh, his plane was delayed. And so, but it's okay. He's in a car on his way here and you're not going to miss any of his songs because we've rejiggered the set list to, uh, you know, to make sure everything, we, we still fit everything in. It's like, okay, that's weird. Like you could have waited 30 minutes to start the show. It would have been fine. Like, Cause they started, I think the ticket time was eight and they started at maybe eight Oh five. So like they had room, they could have, you know, pushed it back to eight twenty, and no one would have noticed that it was late, you know, but, um, Todd showed up. Walks on like, you know, bursts on stage. He's clearly not dressed in stage clothes yet. Uh, he's not wearing sunglasses. He's just wearing regular glasses, which I've never seen on Todd Rundgren before. Uh, and he's got some T-shirt and sweats on. Like, clearly, this is what he traveled in today. And he walks on stage. He grabs his guitar and somebody says, all right, let's play Taxman. Todd's like, great. <laughs> and he rips through this, like, kick-ass version of Taxman. <laughs> He sings it, plays the, the, he played the guitar solo in it and everything. And then as soon as they finish, he's like, all right, now I got to go pee. And he puts his guitar down and he leaves the stage. And that really, I don't know how the rest of the performances for this tour were, but that night was, it was like watching a band rehearsal with, with a band that had not seen each other in a few weeks. Uh, it, it, or more like it was completely like half disorganized right up until the moment that somebody counted, you know, beat four of a count in. And then suddenly these songs just emerged that were perfect out of them. And and so it was a really weird thing because, you know, like, like it was just like people milling around on stage and not sure what to do. And then somebody counts two, three, four. And suddenly you're hearing Nowhere Man with everything right where it needs to be. <laughs> It's like, guys, this is really bizarre, but um, it was fun, but it was it, it like, obviously all of these people are professionals. They all have, you know, proven their worth in the music industry, but they, it was not a professional show. Let's put it that right. way. It, it, you know, it, 
It was really bizarre. I, I, I enjoyed the heck out of it. I mean, and simply being able to see like Joey Molland play no matter what. Like, I never thought that opportunity would even present itself for me. You know, I like he's he's an old dude. I didn't think he would tour anymore. <laughs> but there he was and he killed it. It was great. You great. know, yeah, it was it was cool, but it was it was weird. It was weird. Todd did come back out later in his, you know, striped shirt because that I've I, anytime I've seen Todd on stage, he's always wearing uh, Right. You know, striped shirt. The vertical stripes. Yeah, the vertical yeah. stripes. Yeah, exactly. And the um and and he had sunglasses on. And he had changed from like gray sweatpants into black sweatpants, which I'm sure from a distance would have looked like, you know, black skinny hey. jeans. But uh yeah. but yeah, they didn't look like that. So they just looked like <laughs> they just looked like black sweatpants. But it was fine. Like it didn't matter. No one like Jason Chef was was dressed up, and and so was Denny Lane and and Joey, and and like I said, Todd dressed like Todd. Todd's a weird dude. Have you ever seen Todd on stage? He's he's got this like metrosexual kind of. It, yeah. He's he's very comfortable being awkward. Is is the the right way that I could describe Todd? Metrosexual is not the right word, but it, it sort of heads in the it leans in that direction. I don't know. He's he's an interesting guy, I, I, and I like the way he performs. Yeah. Yeah. He's an eclectic guy, and his songs are eclectic. I mean, he's yes, kind of the real, the real deal. He he is he is eclecticism. He is. That's a good way of putting it. Well, he had the freedom to create whatever career for Todd Rundgren, the songwriter, that he wanted because he made all his money, um, or he made enough money from producing "Bad Out of Hell" that he could he didn't have to worry about anything else after that. You know that deal? Yep. Did have we talked about that I on the show? It, yeah. Yeah, I think we did. He he, they, the deal they gave him after he refused a few times for anybody listening is they finally offered him a dollar for every record that was sold, and then he agreed to produce "Bad Out of Hell." Now, mm. yeah, that's which a lot, record was seven ninety nine then or eight yeah. ninety nine or something like that, right? Right, like that's the thing. Like nobody got a dollar, but except Todd. And Todd was like, seriously, you're going to give me a dollar? Yeah, I'll yeah. sign. Yeah, let's go. I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, it sounds too good to be true, but it turned out it was much better than he could have imagined. But he also was the right producer for that record. Like, I think it, they sounds knew great. that they needed somebody that understood how to marry rock and roll with theatrics in the audio realm, you know, and make that work because that's what that record is. It's a bizarre record if, if you actually zoom out and look at it. You know. And they had the right, you know, basically half of the E Street Band plays on it. I think a couple of Heartbreakers play on it. So That's right. Uh, yeah. 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 They had the, right, the right musicians were picked as well. Yeah, you're right. Everything was done properly for that record. Um, yeah. Anyway, so where are we anyway? We're still in the middle of the show, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> we're somewhere. We're somewhere. It's good. I'm I'm uh, glad we're uh, I'm glad we're here. We t- we took another week off last week, and I, I missed this. Don't get me wrong. I had a lot going on last week, so it it was having the the time was was not unwelcome. But well, I think both of us have crazy Julys in August, right? So we're we gonna do. we're gonna start recording on a on Sunday nights or something, now, right? Something like that. I think we're gonna we're gonna experiment and find a way to make sure we can fit the show into our schedules, even as our schedules evolve. So right. Yep. Let us know what right. you think, folks. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We've got, um, oh, I do. You know what? There is one more thing I want to share from listener Andrew. Uh, he sent us this cool thing. It's called Rock in Recycle. And I'll put a link in the show notes. But uh, it, uh, it's, it's for recycling guitar strings. And they say that they can, there, there's a lot that can be done with all those used guitar strings and they've got like drop off points and all of these things. Their goal is to recycle 10 million guitar strings. So mm. we'll put, yeah, we'll put a link in the, in the show notes for all of this. And thank you, Andrew, for sending that in. I think that's a pretty cool, pretty cool little thing. So yeah, thanks for hipping us to that. It's good stuff. All right. Well, now I, now I'm done. I, I, I think you got anything else? I'm good. All right, folks. Thanks for listening. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We would love to hear your thoughts. We'd love to hear things like Andrew shared. We'd love to hear how your summer's looking. Thoughts on being a pro. What does that mean to you? Let us know. What's it mean to be a pro? Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. What do we say, Paul? 
always be performing, Dave. 